hand over to Emma, who will convene the next block. Hi everyone, I'm here. Okay, so let's see. So the first speaker that we have, for the first speaker we have Sebastian. Hello. Hi Sebastian. So um, the format that you probably already know, it's 25 plus five. So when it, you have five minutes left, just to make sure you have enough time for the questions, I will send you a message in chat to let, to alert you. Okay, okay. great. Okay, do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so remove that. And, okay, so today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the possibility to detect maybe um, light parameter black holes with uh, high frequency gravitational wave detectors and in particular um, with um, an electromagnetic, uh, a resonant electromagnetic detector. Uh, that is a concept that uh, uh, we have proposed with uh, Nicola Herman, who talked already yesterday during the discussion section, and who was really at the heart of uh, all this calculation. And uh, so I know he's finishing his PhD, so I'm advert advertising uh, his work uh, um, in this context. And uh, on my side, I more uh, brought the expertise in the context of common and black holes. So uh, here is the slide of the talk. I will try to focus on, on, on four points. Uh, first, uh, just a reminder of uh, the idea of uh, forming parameter black holes in the early universe. What are the limits? Uh, what are the motivations? Uh, and uh, then uh, what are the gravitational wave signatures of PBH that we could expect, especially uh, the high frequency ones? Because the, the, the main point is that parameter black holes are no rest, uh, have not a restricted mass, and so they can be light and they can emit uh, gravitational waves at very high frequencies. And then I will, uh, uh, following the discussion of yesterday, I will try to make maybe a, a simpler uh, introduction to this uh, resonant electromagnetic detector based on the inverse Gerstenstein effect. Um, and as a pr uh, perspective, uh, we have computed some potential limits uh, with what we think could be a realist realistic design, uh, uh, so limits on the abundance of planetary mass parameter black holes. So let's start with uh, PBH formation. So th the basic idea is that if there are some pre-existing large inhomogeneities in the universe, if at some regions the, it exceeds a threshold value, then the inhomogeneity will collapse gravitationally and will form a black hole. And so the inhomogeneities that are smaller they typically re-enter inside the Hubble horizon uh, at earlier time and then form less massive black holes. And the ones that are larger, they will form more massive black holes. The problem is that the threshold is of order one. And so you need an over density of order one in order to produce a parameter black hole. But on cosmological scales, uh, you know that uh, we see uh, uh, fluctuations of the order of 10 to minus five in the CMB. So that means that if you want to produce parameter black holes, you need a specific model, for instance, of inflation that would produce on small scales, kind of a peak in a poor spectrum or a change of uh, amplitude, let's say. And if you change the position of the peak, you can change the mass of the black holes. And if you get a higher peak, you will get higher abundance of parameter black holes. So uh, we can compute, uh, so, so if you have Gaussian fluctuation, you can compute the, the amount of black holes that we, you will form at the time of formation in terms of the density of the universe in the, in, in, inside PBH. And if you, so if you want to integrate all the perturbations above the threshold, since they are Gaussian, you integrate a Gaussian and you get a complementary error function, which is approximately also a, a decaying exponential, uh, which is the origin of the exponential sensitivity uh, of the threshold regarding the abundance of parameter black holes. So that means that if you change a little bit the threshold or if you change a little bit the amplitude of the power spectrum, then you change by a lot the abundance of parameter black holes. So there is kind of double fine tuning problem because you need to uh, locate your peak where you would like to have your PBH mass. For instance, uh, I don't know, 30 solar mass black holes, uh, if, you, if you think of LIGO-Virgo observations. 
And you need also to tune the amplitude of, of the peak. And so that's a difficult problem that there are some way to solve it somehow. I will not talk about that uh, today. I will just uh, maybe give the connection between the mass of the pram of the black holes, the redshift of formation. So it's the bottom and top. On, on the left, you have the scale that uh, the scale uh, corresponding to the inhomogeneity that collapse and the temperature at which it, it re-enters inside, inside the horizon. So typically, when you think of solar mass black holes, you are thinking of uh, QCD phase transition. And if you think of planetary mass black holes, it's, it's more like the electrobit transition. So there are a lot of uh, astrophysical and cosmological limits on primary black hole and the, on the abundance of primary black holes. So here is just a summary. And I dislike this kind of plot a lot because uh, in fact, all of these limits have their caveats, their assumptions. And especially if you uh, think of the solar mass scale, you see many limits, but uh, in fact, you can, they, they are really model dependent. They are dependent on the, on the mass function. They are dependent on the rate prescriptions that you assume, the matching weight prescriptions on the clustering and so on. And so it's difficult to, to say, okay, we exclude really dark matter to be made of solar mass black holes, for instance. Huh? Uh, but nevertheless, um, Bernard Carr and Florian Kunel has maybe pointed a few places where Primary black holes could contribute importantly, or even maybe totally, to the dark matter that are uh, point A on asteroid mass, point B on planetary mass, especially because we see some micro lensing events um, towards the galactic center that could uh, that could support the idea that a, a, a fraction of dark matter is made of uh, of planetary mass black holes. That's one of the motivations of our work, in fact. Point C, uh, this is where LIGO Virgo events are, and uh, point D, uh, you can uh, forget about them. <laughs> so when I say that there is no reason to have particular mass of uh, for the primary black holes, in fact, it's not really the case because there is a reason, for instance, to have solar mass black holes, and that's the QCD transition. Because uh, as I said, if you change a little bit the threshold, you change a lot the abundance of primary black holes. And this is what happens at the QCD transition, because you have a change in the number of relativistic degrees of freedom. It's, it's non-physics. And, and then that means that for any kind of models based on uh, pre-existing perturbations, you will boost the formation of primary black holes at the QCD transition. And so, in fact, you don't need a peak in the power spectrum. You can just even have just a nearly scale invariant power spectrum with the spectral index of 0 0.97 or around that, so typical to inflation a boosted amplitude compared to the CMB scales, but nevertheless scale invariant or almost scale invariant. And then you get this kind of very wide mass functions in which you have uh, the, the many, many black holes at the stellar mass in the stellar mass range that could explain Lagovic observations, but also many black holes that are at planetary mass or asteroid, uh, asteroid mass scales. And if you look at this kind of mass distribution, this is interesting because, for instance, at the planetary mass scale, you have this, this micro lensing events since seen by Ogle uh, in combination with Gaia data. Um, and and uh, this suggests that maybe a fraction between 1% and 10% of the dark matter is made of such black holes. And what well, this could be also floating planets, but having one per, even 1% 1 of the dark matter made of floating planets is quite a lot. It's, more or less the same, the same order of magnitude than the, 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 the mass of the stars, let's say, of the density of the stars. And so it's, it's, it's really, maybe it's really a hint in, in pointing to the existence of primal black holes towards the galactic center. And so we are focusing on, on, on this range. Then let's look at the gravitational wave signatures. I just we just mentioned four types of gravitational waves that are emitted by uh, primary black holes. First of all, if you have uh, binaries that are very close to Earth, but still far from merging, they will emit continuous waves during their inspiral phase. Of course, the amplitude is much less than uh, during the major, for instance. This is the number two. Uh, but nevertheless, if they are very close, they, they could uh, uh, emit continuous waves, continuous gravitational waves during a very long time. 
Then you have the standard measures that you can study with waveforms. Then you have uh, more uh, distant sources, high redshift sources that will produce a gravitational wave background, the stochastic gravitational wave background. And also, uh, you expect for PBH to have a gravitational wave background from the density fluctuations themselves at the origin of the PBH formations, because they source at second order gravitational waves. And so those are uh, really primordial. Uh, this is really a primordial black hole. Um, back up. So for continuous waves, uh, so you can estimate the amplitude of the strain and um, the, the also the spin up of, of these kind of binaries. And uh, so typically we have studied uh, in, in these papers, for instance, there is one with Nancy uh, who, that appeared just today. Uh, and we studied how LIGO Virgo, for instance, could set limits on planetary mass uh, uh, black holes. Uh, that are relatively nearby within the galaxy. If you think of high frequency gravitational wave detector, you can use the same formula and look at asteroid mass, for instance. And if you take uh, 10 to minus 13 solar mass, and this is interesting because there, there is a place where there is no constraint at the moment on, on the abundance of this uh, kind of uh, PBH. So. They would be in the solar system, so astro astronomical unit, and a frequency of 10 to 12 hertz, then you get a strain of the order of 5 times 10 to minus 25. That maybe could be detected with a high frequency gravitational wave detector. But in our work, we more studied the, the sources uh, coming from, from uh, measures. And so you use the same formula, but you go at the, at the measure frequency, which is more or less the ISCO frequency, the innermost uh, stable circular orbit. And uh, that means that, in fact, if you replace f, then you get the h as a function of distance and the chirp mass. And if you have some merging weights that come from the theory, then you can extract the typical amplitude that you would get uh, for h, uh, given, for instance, one event per year that you would detect in your detector. So with LIGO Virgo, this, you get the sensitivity of LIGO Virgo at distance of 100 to 1,000 megaparsecs. So it corresponds to the ones that uh, maybe we see. Um, and for high frequency gravitational wave detectors, you can think of planetary mass black holes. And in that case, if you take a chirp mass of 10 to minus 5 solar mass, a distance of 1 gigaparsec, an ISCO frequency then of 200, to, uh, 200 megahertz, then you get a strain of the order of 10 to minus 28. And this is the kind of update check that we could target with electromagnetic uh, high frequency detectors. For instance, uh, in our work, we uh, Nicola simulated the waveform uh, of the signal that typically uh, lasts for 10 to minus 5 seconds and uh, with a strain of 10 to minus 28 if the binary is located at 1 gigaparsec distance. But binaries could be a bit uh, nearby. And so in, in, in the, this uh, long paper um, uh, on, on the review on the high frequency gravitational waves, so we computed the typical strain that you would expect for uh, measures of early binaries. And, and you see, in fact, that it's even larger than 10 to minus 28 uh, if uh, all the dark matter would be made of such black holes. But if it's not the case, then it will be smaller than the black line, and you would be more like uh, in, in, the, in the gray, in the pink region. You can also produce a gravitational wave background. Um, you would also produce a gravitational wave background. And so you, here, here is the kind of formula that you can use. Uh, and tau here is the merging weights of the black holes. So you see that for LIGO Virgo, you would get something like of the order of 10 to minus 25, 26, or something like that. But uh, you can think also of high frequency uh, detectors. And then I, I uh, ask an open question. Uh, are high frequency detectors more convenient for individual, individual sources or for a stochastic background? Because in fact, you could take profit of integrating over a long period. And so maybe it's different than in, in just uh, uh, usual gravitational wave detectors. Maybe the formula are different. Maybe, and, and this is something maybe we could investigate in the future. And finally, the gravitational wave background from density fluctuations themselves. It's interesting because, for instance, at LIGO Virgo frequency, you are already probing very, very light black holes, 10 to minus 15 solar mass black holes. And in fact, this is more at nano edge frequency that you would uh, uh, produce a background uh, coming from uh, stellar mass black holes. 
but you can go to higher frequency as well. And you could study very, very light black holes. And for instance, at the megahertz, uh, from megahertz to gigahertz, you could explore the good scale where you would have evaporated black holes, but they would come from large density fluctuations at the good scale or after inflation or during rating or whatever. And for instance, they would produce, this would produce a black holes of the order of a gram or even a bit less. And, and you, you would expect this kind of uh, amplitude uh, going down to uh, very high frequencies if, if you have these slight black holes. Then I'm going to uh, mention this uh, electromagnetic detector. So in, the, in his talk, Nicola already uh, presented uh, this, this detector. And so I'm just trying maybe to explain in easier words for just maybe beginners. Uh, like me, in fact, huh? because I'm, I'm not an expert in, in, in this kind of detectors. I'm more experts in, in PBHs. And so I can just explain how I see the thing. And so um, all comes from GR. In, in GR, you have electromagnetic fields that uh, contribute to the electric energy momentum tensor in Einstein equations. That means that, in fact, gravitational waves, they can produce electromagnetic radiation. And if you think of a strong electromagnetic fields, uh, uh, then you would in fact boost the effect. You would have a first order effect on top of a zero order effect that would be your uh, strong uh, magnetic field, for instance. And in the case of a strong uh, static magnetic field, this is called the inverse Gerstenstein effect. And in our, in our paper, we studied additionally the boost that you would get by using the fact that you would have a resonant cavity. So you can use a, a resonance in order to gain one order of magnitude in the sensitivity roughly. So uh, does this kind of detector exist? And the answer is yes. The problem is that they cannot be applied <laughs> to uh, gravitational wave detection. And the, this kind of detector is, is just a DMX and, uh, that is used for the action, action detection. This is exactly the experiment that you need, except that the magnetic field is misoriented. You need to, to, to move it by 90 degrees in order to allow for gravitational wave detector detection. And, and it's possible to show with calculation that you will excite only the modes uh, that are orthogonal to the magnetic field. So you, need, you would need to change it. But the, the kind of experiment, this is a microwave cavity with a tuning rod that allows to explore different ranges of frequencies. The, 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 our proposal is just exactly that. Oh, sorry. And so I, I just to give an idea, I, I looked at the papers uh, of people working on ADMX, and you can get the frequency. For instance, uh, for a radius of the order of one meter, you get something like 100 megahertz, which is exactly what I need for this kind of planetary mass black holes. And you can compute the signal to noise ratio that you would get. The P is the power uh, recorded and, and accumulated in, in the apparatus. And the signal to noise, to noise ratio roughly goes like square root of time. And um, so that means that depending on the time, you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, get a larger signal to noise ratio. And typically what they do for action experiments, they, they require, they know the power that you would get uh, from the actions. And so they fix the time in order to get a signal to noise ratio that is enough to claim for a detection or to exclude the action mass. But uh, typically they, 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 they accumulate power uh, during like days or weeks. Uh, and they get a sensitivity of the order of 10 to minus 22 watts, which is incredible. In, 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 this is really excellent. And so this is maybe the point that sometimes people say, OK, no, these the, the detectors are not realistic. Please have a look to ADMX. What they are able to do is just amazing, 10 to minus 22 watts. And so that means that, OK, if you think of a signal like a PBH measure of 10 to minus 5 seconds, if you take naively this equation, in fact, uh, your detector, just like a DMX, would, be, would have a power sensitivity of 10 to minus 16 watts. And we assume 10 to minus 10 in our paper. So 1 million times more than just the equation that uh, could give. So in fact, I, I really believe that 
maybe our detector, uh, the, our proposal of detector and the configuration that we take, maybe we can even do better if we think of IDMX, for instance. But I'm not experimentalist, and so I would like, I would not like to say, okay, this is sure that it's uh, possible to do. I, I just don't know. But, uh, but if we follow just these simple equations, this is what you get. And then the guide uh, for beginners, let's say, for the calculation. And so let's start from where we know. So we know uh, the Einstein equations, where you can have the electromagnetic uh, energy momentum tensor, and that uh, contains the Faraday tensor, and we have uh, the, Maxwell, the Maxwell equations. And so you just need to expand the covariant derivative in step two, perturb your Minkowski metric in the Lorentz gauge, uh, and also the Faraday tensor to have just the, the zero order that is your magnetic field and the first order that will be the, 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 the change in the electromagnetic field uh, produced by the, the gravitational wave that passes, and you get an ugly equation. Okay, so I don't want to focus on this ugly equation uh, because in fact, it, it is really simplified when you assume a, a simple configuration, which is what we did, a static magnetic field and a plane wave, a plane gravitational wave in, this, in the Z direction that is uh, just in the direction uh, of the cylinder. And in that case, you end up with just this kind of very simple equation so H is, is, is the, the strain, huh? and uh, you have the two polarization of, of, the, of the gravitational wave. And so in fact, uh, you get a, a, a magnetic field that, that would be produced uh, that will go like uh, B0 and like, uh, like uh, H also. And, and so altogether, from, just from this equation, it's possible to compute the energy uh, with just dimensional analysis, just to compute the energy that you would uh, gain uh, in, in your detector. And that will go like B0 squared L cube over mu zero, uh, the usual one, H that is just the, the typical strain and F is an order one factor uh, depending on the, on, on the uh, exact shape of the detector. And this equation, this is exactly the same one that they have for axioms. Huh? It's just that H in their, in, in their uh, so L cube is the volume of the detector and H for action is just replaced by the gamma, uh, gamma, uh, the, the G factor, the G gamma gamma factor uh, times the number density of actions. But otherwise this is exactly the same thing. And so in fact, if you take ADMX, like B0 is uh, seven, between seven and eight Tesla. L is of the, of the order, L cube is of the order of 0 0.1, uh, mu zero 10 to minus six. You take the, your strain of the order of 10 to minus 28 and you get 10 to minus 20 joules, which corresponds to 10 to minus 15 watts for the duration of the gravitational wave signal. So that means that, okay, this is above the estimation that I did just before. Uh, uh, and, uh, of 10 to minus 16 watts. This is not uh, as much as we have uh, computed uh, because we took uh, different designs where L is larger and, and, and so on. And so we can boost in fact, and with the form factor as well uh, to 10 to minus uh, 11 uh, with an optimal experimental design. And when we do the full simulation, including the resonance and so on, you can gain a, a little bit more and go to 10 to minus 10 watts. But I would say that maybe even with the kind of ADMX experiment, we, 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 we could already be, uh, it could already be uh, very interesting. In fact. And so uh, let me conclude uh, with uh, then what it means for primal black holes. So we have uh, simulated the, the, the signal in this apparatus for different masses, um, so different uh, duration of the signal with different strain because they were all located at one gigaparsec. And so this gives us the typical, uh, the typical watt that we take in, in the two, uh, the, well, in the two kind of detector that we have proposed. You have the ISCO frequency here. And uh, from that, you can, uh, you can combine with the expected merging weights of prominent black holes and obtain a limit on the, on the FPBH, the abundance of prominent black holes with a tilt because in fact, it's normalized with some, uh, some suppression factor in the merging weights, but anyway. 
And uh, we obtained that. So you have in Orange the Ogle Gaia data. And so uh, we obtained that we, this kind of experiments could probe maybe uh, the, the, the black hole mergers uh, in clusters or also the black hole, uh, the, merger, the merging of uh, early binaries uh, of primary black holes. So the ones that are formed directly at the time of formation, but that are merging today. And so to, just to conclude, so the, this kind of resonant electromagnetic detectors, they seems to be uh, very nice. So they are based on, on gravitational wave photon conversion in presence of a, of a large static magnetic field. They are just like ADMX. If you want to have in, an, an image uh, or picture in mind, think of ADMX. This is exactly the same, except that the B field must be retained. And if you uh, take uh, just uh, uh, designs that are achievable with the current technology, then we, we could detect uh, 10 to minus 28 for the strain at uh, something like 100 megahertz frequency. Uh, and if one can achieve a power sensitivity of 10 to minus 10, which seems to be not so, uh, not so, not not really extreme in in in, in the view of uh, the power uh, that uh, can be reached by ADMX, for instance. And in that case, we could probe planetary mass primordial black hole measures and set complementary limits on on this interesting mass range because we have already some micro lensing observations that could already hint at their existence there. And so uh, here are some uh, maybe propositions uh, uh, and that we already discussed a bit uh, yesterday. So maybe we could explore the possibility to reuse maybe an existing experiment because it would be really nice to try to uh, progress on, on the real implementation of this kind of experiment. And then when, when we have a more uh, precise uh, experiment, then maybe redo and check and refine the calculations for this kind of more realistic design and also take more, um, take additional effects into a coin, I don't know, uh, noise or something like that. And finally, I would find very interesting to study the possibility also to uh, uh, study a gravitational wave background uh, uh, from PBH maybe, but not only because 100 megahertz is exactly the kind of frequency that you would expect for any uh, violent phenomena uh, at, at, the, at the scale of the quantified theory. And so this kind of detector, it could be really something that could go to uh, energies uh, that are much higher than you can go with uh, particle accelerators and uh, other uh, gravitational wave detectors. So thank you very much. And if you have questions. So. Thank you, Sebastian. Juan, go ahead. Thank you. Nice. Uh, nice talk, Sebastian. Wow, I, enjoyed it very oh, much. I just see the number of hands. <laughs> so I, I have a question which is related to some of the discussion from yesterday, and it has to do with your enhancement in the quality factor due to the resonance. Yeah. So you, you say you can go from 10 to the minus 15 watts to 10 to the 10 watts with a large Q factor yeah, due yeah, to yeah. resonance? It's not the resonance. Huh? The resonance, it, it will give you just maybe one order of magnitude. It's, okay. it's, it's more the the the... the the apparatus the itself, so the size the of, the, of the experiment, the magnetic field, and so on. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you about the resonance because uh, typically uh, those resonances would have a relatively narrow. It could be a broad resonance. No, yeah. it could have a relatively narrow frequency yeah. domain. So, are you envisioning changing this uh, narrow resonance, moving it through the whole frequency range in order to detect put constraints on different masses yeah. or? How exactly, you... that, that, that would be a, a possibility, uh, exactly like uh, what ADMX is doing. They are, they are changing the resonance frequency by moving the rods inside the cavity. Okay. And so this way they can explore for, for some time uh, one given frequency and then move to another frequency and so on. So I, I noticed that in, in your constraints on the masses, you had something like uh, four orders of magnitude. Can you really move frequency that far in your, uh, your detector? Four orders no, of magnitude. No, I I don't think so. No, I, I think that you can you can move the frequency, but uh, I'm not sure that you can move by four orders of magnitude. Huh? Okay. So you, you you can more I think explore like a, a range of mass uh, close close that would correspond to frequencies that are relatively close to the resonance frequency. Okay, thank you. Camilo, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me, Sebastian? Yeah. Um, yeah thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so I was just 
wondering uh, something very similar to the previous question. Uh, because uh, it seems to me that uh, this uh, experiment AD ADMX uh, attempts to uh, use a resonance uh, to, to, to measure a power, right? Exactly. But in your case, uh, I mean, of course, the signal is not uh, really monochromatic. So why can you apply this uh, order of magnitude estimate? Uh, I mean, the, the one you just show. Uh, so why does it apply in that case if there is no resonance? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure to have understood uh, all the question. <laughs> um, so, well, so can, can you go back to the, the slide where you explained your uh, yeah, sure. your estimate of the power? Uh... So up uh, while uh, it's um, the yeah. SNR slide, yeah, yeah this one. Yeah, so so this kind of formula, this is something. No, no, I, I mean, the, uh, there was another one where you explained delta E. Yeah, E, delta E. Yeah, exactly. So my, my question is, does this rely on the fact that there is a resonance? No, this one, no. So this one is just an evaluation by orders of magnitude. So there is even no resonance here. It's, it's, it's just, a, yeah, an estimation. Uh, in, fact, in, fa in fact, you can compute this delta E by taking all the resonant modes. And so you sum over all the resonance modes and you get something a little bit higher than this. But so are you like on the same line, are you taking into account like what integration time are you are you taking here when you... So here... Because typically you get B dot B is power, not energy, right? So you have to assume some time. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so the signal uh, uh, in the strain has a, a time duration, and so you can you can change this energy in, into just uh, watts. And of course, the time scale is much lower than the one that you are using for axions, because they are more la looking like uh, continuous waves uh, that would uh, that would uh, mm -hmm. yeah last okay. a while. Uh, so, is, is that strain per hertz HGW? Strain per hertz unit. No, it's a strain uh, itself. Okay, because yeah, usually with a resonance system, you measure strain per hertz if the bandwidth of the signal is wider than your resonance. Yeah, exactly. So this is if you look at uh, well, this is encoded in this equation. Uh, the bandwidth, the bandwidth is b, and so if you think of uh, computing a signal to noise ratio, then you need to take into account the bandwidth also. Yeah. Yeah, uh, um, I had a question. Um, is uh, I missed part of your talk because I, I was busy. I've just arrived home and everything, but I saw half of it, so I might have missed something. But um, if you say you have to rotate the magnetic field, can you just use a different polarization mode in your cavity? Ha! Huh, that's a very good question. And uh, well, I thought about that, but uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure to be able to answer <laughs> because I just don't know, in fact. Uh, so it seems to me you should be because if you're using a transverse yeah, yeah, magnetic yeah, yeah. mode. This, this, yeah, this is a really a very good point huh? because if, if this was possible, then it would be fantastic because we could already use the data from ADMX to set yeah, yeah. on, on the ground. I, our group is part of ADMX cal cal calibration. Yeah, yeah, We're part yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so what they do is they measure a mode which is insensitive to axions and a mode which is sensitive. But the mode that they're measuring that's insensitive is actually another TM mode, but you could use a TE mode. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if they did use a TE mode, um, then the, maybe that's sensitive. Yeah, that, that, that would be a, a very good idea to explore. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see what you mean. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know the answer, but it's certainly interesting. Okay, I think we should um, hold on for the other questions until the next discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian, for the nice talk. And uh, let's move on to Carlo.